And that taught me the power of niche influencers, I'll call them, because you can pay a million bucks to Kim Kardashian and probably get a ton of people to see your product, right? But when it comes to niche influencers, if you have a product that really works for a very specific group, find a very specific ambassador, celebrity, influencer, whoever it is, athlete in my case, and you will get a great response. I'm just going to kick this off by saying uh, this is the first episode that I've done on this podcast where I'm wearing my guest's t-shirt. All right. That's perfect. So, we have a first today. I got my, I'm wearing uh, my t-shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that makes two of us. We got something in common. That's all I wear. <laughs> so I literally, uh, just to do a quick intro for you. So you've, you've done a bunch of stuff in the e-commerce space. You have an agency you just launched recently. Uh, but the way that I met you is because I was a customer of your last business that you just recently sold, tallslimtees.com. Uh, yeah. If you open up my closet, I literally have in like five or six different colors, mostly black and grays. I probably have about 40 uh, tall slim tee uh, v-neck t-shirts in my closet. So uh, I've been a longtime customer and uh, really awesome business. I'd love to hear kind of like what, obviously you're tall. I'm six foot eight. I'm sure you're probably close to my height too or taller I'm only yeah. six six you're only six okay <laughs> only <laughs> <laughs> i got you by two inches <laughs> yeah so um you know obviously that's probably you know you had the same problem i've had is trying to find t-shirts that fit and uh they're either like too boxy and huge or they're like you know like a belly shirt showing your your belly button so uh Obviously, I, I see the need being a tall guy for uh, tall slim oh, yeah. tees, but uh, I'd love to kind of hear like what got you to kick that off and build the company and uh, ultimately what the middle part was like and then why you ended up selling it. Sure. Yeah, it was a, it was a random uh, series of events, I guess we'd say. Um, when I started my career in uh, digital marketing, I was doing search engine optimization and got into um, affiliate marketing. And so I was running the affiliate program for Icon Health and Fitness, which is the largest equipment manufacturer, fitness equipment manufacturer in the world, or they were, uh, you know, 10 plus years ago. And um, they have brands like Nordic Track, Proform. It was going great. We, I was reviewing these treadmills. I had this big team. We had videos. We were doing a lot of great things. And then it was like 2012, I want to say. And Google updated their algorithm. And decided, no, eh, we're not really fans of affiliate sites anymore. And suddenly this money-making machine was slapped and a lot less than it was. And I had to start thinking, hmm, <laughs> maybe this affiliate thing isn't, isn't uh, the way of the future for me. And so um, that's when I first explored e-commerce and thought, oh, maybe, this is, maybe there's something to this. Because I know how to do the marketing. I know how to build a website. I can do all this stuff. I've just never done thing where done anything where I'm the one selling something. And so a neighbor of mine, he's a trucker. He drives an auto transport truck. So he moves cars. There's um, a huge well, car. Uh, just to go back for the affiliate thing. Uh, sure. I love affiliate marketers. They're like some of the most ridiculous creative geniuses that I've met. Yeah, you have to uh, be. <laughs> I've heard stories like, uh, you know, I, I just heard one this week, actually, you know, the new Kia logo, it kind of looks like it says KN. Yeah. Uh, someone launched a site called like knCar.com or something like that. And yeah. uh, because just in the last couple of months since that new logo came out, there's just been this huge spike of searches yeah, for like 30,000 searches for KN cars. Yeah. Something. So, like, what's the like, someone's like, hey, there's an affiliate opportunity here. I'm going to go launch a KN car website. And uh, so, like, affiliate marketers, the kind of stuff they think about to drive traffic sometimes, it just blows my mind. Uh, the creativity yeah, they, they is the, very creative. You have to be. That's the only way to survive in the industry. Oftentimes, sites get stale. It's hard to keep up with content because Google's just always rewarding content. And with affiliates, you just have your one little affiliate link. And now even just, I think it was this week or last, Google's already said, we're going to start rewarding sites that have multiple links. So if you're a product review site, normally you have one Amazon affiliate link and that's how you make money. Well, now they said they're going to start rewarding sites that use multiple links to multiple stores and shops. Mm. to try to discourage they, they're always trying to discourage the affiliate stuff and it's this ongoing battle and then the affiliate marketers they evolve and adapt 
And um, for me, rather than evolve and adapt, I thought, you know, I'm going to head towards e-commerce because it seemed a little safer. Amazon was taking over the world at the time. It seemed like a good wagon to hitch onto. And so um, my neighbor who drives that truck said, man, I've always got this problem. Whenever you hit a flat and you're uh, driving on the highway on these big rigs, I can't change my tire. I have to sit there for hours and wait for a service truck to come and, and get the tire off and, and help me out and stuff. He said, wouldn't it be great if we could get our own tires off? And he found this random little tool in China called a torque multiplier wrench. It looks really strange. And we ordered one in and we just branded it and we called it the cheater wrench instead of a cheater bar that you normally use to take lug nuts off a, off a car. It's a cheater wrench and it allowed anyone to generate well over 500 foot pounds of torque easily enough to break the lug nuts off a truck and um, change your own tire on the road. For an owner operator, that's huge because time is money when you're driving these things. So we launched cheaterwrench.com. We put it on Amazon and we thought, well, let's just try this. And it just blew up. <laughs> We were the feature tool at the end of the year, tool of the year for Trucking Magazine. What year was uh, that that you did that? Gosh, 2012, 13, somewhere around there. And Landline was featuring us. We were just, every trucker basically had heard of us. And even competitors started to shoot up. And they all said, oh, we have the best cheater wrench on the road. So we had basically accomplished what Rollerblade, Kleenex, Band-Aid, all these brands have accomplished by becoming the generic phrase for your product right so no one called, called it a torque multiplier wrench they all called it a cheater wrench which was our trademark name and it was great so then we started thinking what else can we do when we did you uh, we like stick your lawyers on them to uh stop using your no name. we were we were we were thrilled that the people that were ranking ahead of us or or near us in video search and stuff like that were calling theirs a cheater wrench because then people would just google cheater wrench and find us ours is the only one with that you know we stamped our logo on the on the case and everything it was great. We loved it. And we thought, well, this wasn't too hard. Let's find other things. So we did tools, we did other toys, we did all this stuff. And then finally, my light bulb went off and I thought, you know what? I've never been able to find a t-shirt that actually just fits. <laughs> and I went to Google and I searched t-shirts for tall skinny guys. And every result was a forum on Reddit or t-shirtforum.net or something where the forum thread question was, Hey, does anyone know where I can get t-shirts for tall skinny guy? And all the questions, all the responses were no, but if you ever find out, please let us know. So I thought, hmm, maybe there's an opportunity here. So well, I'm until uh call. until I found your site, the only place that I found that sells t-shirts my size is uh uh oh. the Net Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Where where the average male is like six one or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> they actually make it for us. Of course, the shipping is probably outrageous. But um, yeah. yeah, there there was no one doing it in the States. There was TooTall.com had just started in the UK. And they were doing everything. It wasn't just shirts. They had all kinds of stuff. So their t-shirt selection was pretty minimal um, at the time. So I thought, okay, got on Alibaba and found a manufacturer out of uh, China. They were the only ones who would work with me because our we were doing custom sizing. And most factories said to do custom, you're going to have to do 20,000 shirts a month or something. And I can't do that or afford that right now. And they said, oh, okay, well, if you want to do only a few hundred, you've got to do our, our standard sizing. So this one manufacturer out of China was the only one that said, we'll do your custom sizes and we'll do whatever quantities you want. You just have to get a minimum of one uh, bundle of fabric, which would make roughly 70 t-shirts. So it took about six months of sampling with them to finally get the fit right. All the dimensions and the ratios of length to width and uh, sleeves. And you wouldn't believe how many things we went through. Fabrics, just tons and tons of trial and error until we finally got this one shirt came. And I tried it on guys 6'1 to 6'7. And this shirt fit everyone. And I'm like, I have a magic shirt. <laughs> what is with this shirt? It just fit everyone. And it was always long enough. It was snug enough. It stretched just fine. It wasn't wrinkling after we washed it. It didn't shrink. It was the perfect shirt. So we made that the medium size because that was what 50% of our customers at the end of the day would order medium. That's what and, I, I'm 6'8 and I wear the medium. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, the largest for guys who aren't necessarily that slim. They're just really tall, but maybe a little more 
built extra large is it was like seven footers basically the only one who could wear something that long there's a dress on me and i'm six six <laughs> so um we finally got it right and launched it in 2014 i think summer of 2014 and just like before it was met with just instant adulation everyone was just a huge fan they wanted to get they wanted more colors more styles more 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 all we had was the the v-neck what am i wearing v yeah v-neck and round neck in four colors and two sizes that that was all we launched with and they were gone in about two months which is how long it took to get more <laughs> what was your first batch how much did you order the first batch was there was 70 of each color and that was divided in half between medium and large and so there was uh two styles there was 140 times four or it was about just under 600 shirts okay and wow. we were selling 20 dollars free shipping and it was only on our website and we yeah in about two months they were almost gone we we started ordering more so then we added more colors and then eventually we added a small size um for the guys who were really really skinny uh eventually we added the extra large for the guys who were just really really tall um funny story the two tallest uh two of the three tallest people who live in utah live were my neighbors <laughs> <laughs> out, of, out of random coincidence one of them is sean bradley who played in the nba for a long time seven six now in his nba days he was a lot more slim <laughs> he uh He's uh, not quite as slim anymore, but um, I his kids were were there, and so I was able to kind of try him with his kids. And then David Foster, who played center for the University of Utah, he's seven three, and he's still very slim. And um, so it was cool to have those guys come in and try him on and model with us and stuff. Um, you have a height we requirement in your neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say yeah, it <laughs> must be this tall to enter, right? Uh, to get to buy out. It was pretty funny how we all ended up by each other um but but it worked out great and so then we started adding long sleeves then we did uh polos and then tank tops and then hoodies, hoodies and sweatshirts and before too long suddenly um this wasn't just a little side business anymore this was a full-fledged like running just fine on its own livable money kind of endeavor and so my my partner who had, was the trucker guy in the end of i think it was 2017 We've been at it for a few years. All all the shirts and tall slim tees stuff, and all the rest of all the other stuff were exactly equal at the end of the year. And I th I said if we're if ever I'm going to just try and do this on my own, now's the, the time. So we amicably separated, and, and he kept everything else, and I took just the shirts and the brand, and um, made an LLC for you know just the shirt brand and everything like that. So like basically he, he split off like the cheetah ranch and all the other things yep. you had going. Yep. So he's been doing that by himself for gosh, now five plus years. He's still doing it. And um, it, it's been going, you know, just fine for him. Well, it makes and, sense. He's and, the trucker and you're the tall guy. Yeah, exactly. I was like, you take the product, you know, you knew all the tools and stuff. You, you're the one who, who made them. And it made a lot of sense. And which he was fine with because he had a full-time job. I had, I was working at Squatty Potty at the time. I was doing their digital marketing. Um, that was the days of the unicorn and the rainbow poop and all that kind of stuff. That was, that was a fun time. I got um, two of those as well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> See, I'm all, yeah, I was going to say, what else about you will uh, order any Balance of Nature uh, supplements online anytime? Uh, I have to check my wife. She orders a lot of supplements, but. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, everywhere I've worked, it's, it's uh, following you. So, <laughs> Your marketing's um, that good, man. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I, I must I must be doing something right. <laughs> so um I left Squatty Potty and did the went to Tulsa Tees full time only thing, and then that was all I did for a few years. And it that was just some of the best times of my life. I, I was the only one um doing doing it all. Um no one else was marketing anything, no one was selling anything, no one was doing I just ordered everything. Uh, came up with all the ideas for ads and marketing campaigns and um, started to work with pro volleyball players. And we really took off um, in the pro beach volleyball space. Pretty much every pro beach volleyball athlete either wore my stuff or or knew who we were. <laughs> I was well acquainted with basically all of them. And it was just a great time. Um, the reason I had to sell, though, I got testicular cancer in 2020. Oh, I'm sorry. And um, surgery, chemo, I had to focus on 
treatments, I couldn't run a business. It was just me. So unless I hired you know the general manager or something, and I just didn't have it in me, and thought you know it's been a good run. It was fun. Um, I think it is, and it, it, we just sort of plateaued. We were doing fine. It was livable money and providing for for me and my family. So for, you wouldn't have you know, sold otherwise then. I probably would have just kept it going. Sure. Um, but with that going, I thought, you know, I need to focus on treatments. And if this is ever, if Tulsa Lentis is ever going to become a household name and, and really grow, it just needs to go with someone else who's really a lot more ambitious and wants to push it and grow it. And so, um, I sold it to the owner of Redwood Tall, who was a, a fairly new competitor in the space, uh, Sam, he's, uh, also six, five, six, six, right around there. And he already had a baby clothing brand, knew what he was doing with e-commerce and apparel. Um, so we took just a few months and that was that I had to, uh, right as I finished up, was finishing up chemos when the sale went through. So I was, had the energy to at least go and box up all the inventory and send it on its way and, um, clear, you know, just clear out the warehouse basically. <laughs> and, and so it was on. just you running the whole, the whole company, like everything, every, you know, customer yeah. support, marketing, logistics uh -huh. supply chain whenever all that i stuff. needed help black friday i'd have to i'd have my two sisters-in-law come pack up orders i mean we'd have the last black friday i did it we had you were packing boxes too you didn't you didn't do a 3pl yeah. or anything no i had every i had all the inventory and i packed everything and how um, many boxes per per day would you get on average that was about 20 orders a day most of them went okay. in flat rate padded envelopes that was pretty easy to do the boxes were for people that ordered like more than four shirts basically and but Black Friday, if we had you know 500 orders to pack up, I don't want people waiting weeks to get their stuff. Yeah. So I'd have uh, my sister, my sisters in law uh, that live around here. I'd be a uh, packing party, everyone show up after Thanksgiving, let's go pack some shirts. So, um, that was always pretty fun to do, but uh, it taught me a ton though. I, I used affiliates, uh, because I knew the affiliate space, I used ambassadors and social media to get it out there. I used SEO, PPC, Facebook ads. I just basically learned the entire arsenal of uh online marketing tactics and just had a great time doing it because the the brand was me so people who liked the brand um were responding to me to my sense of humor to my you know everything was just what i was coming up with which some people didn't like which is fine too <laughs> uh it was definitely a very um light-hearted brand and um just had a blast doing it and learned a ton and uh, wouldn't wouldn't change anything yeah i, I you know huge fan myself uh, so our yeah. listeners are a lot of tech entrepreneurs founders uh you know people building companies you know e-commerce businesses SaaS companies all sorts of stuff um are you comfortable getting into like metrics like kpis cac uh average order value uh, yeah as best, as, as best i remember <laughs> yeah because that kind of stuff is interesting you know sort of like where you saw critical points where metrics maybe flatlined or like grew rapidly, you know, if you saw something grow rapidly, if you ever had something waterfall, you know, where you at the time of exit, kind of where you were at with uh, like revenue and just some of those, those metrics, is that something that you're, uh, you know, comfortable getting into? Yeah, I've got a uh, general ballpark on a lot of it still. I mean, I would always pull up analytics or whatever, you know, at the time um, to, to check those things out. I'll tell you though, the first time that, so like I said, my background is search, search engine optimization, very much a poll strategy, right? And when I saw that the results in Google were just forums asking for my product, I joined all the forums. I answered all those questions and said, hey, everyone, you were looking for these, found them. Link to tell us them tease. Every one of those links is what pushed me up the search rankings. And the links themselves got a lot of clicks. Uh, cause there were a lot of people curious about these kinds of things. And so even to the day I sold it, we would still get traffic from those forums, um, and those different places. Reddit sent a ton of traffic and that's how it sort of started was just, Hey, I know, I know from a search perspective, there's people looking for this that are not being finding what they're looking for. So I can do that. And within a year, we were number one for every search you can think of t-shirts for tall, skinny guys, shirts for tall, slim males, like any variation you could think of, we owned it. And it was great. But um, after that, I thought, okay, maybe we should be trying other things to grow so that, you know, we're kind of plateaued. 
So where did so that get you? Like, uh, just, you know, kind of hitting all the, all the tall guy forums and like, you know, owning all the organic keywords. Uh, what was, you know, how many orders per month did that get you? And, uh, sort of like, what was, um, what am I trying to ask here? Like, what was, uh, uh, you know, kind of what, what, what was the market size on that? So that got us when I, when I first launched, it was like summer and from the, Summer till the end of the year, we did about twenty to thirty thousand in sales, and um, towards the spring of the following year is when we started to sort of own the search more, and that pushed us up to about a hundred. It, it was about five times just from moving up in search. Nice from word of, going from essentially so the, what was the word forums kind of mouth got forums. you like twenty percent of the way there, then the search got you right. the other eighty percent of that revenue. And the way search works, the forums are what basically made the search work because all those links got is links from other websites to yours are what push you up Google search. And so they got us direct traffic, which got us maybe 20,000. <clears> but over a full year, that would have been more like 40. And then after about half a year of, of owning search, we were at 100,000. Then we got to about 150 and we plateaued in about 2016 timeframe. At, at about 150 in revenue. And we were, our margin was not great because we did free shipping. Um, it was expensive to get the shirts here from China and everything. And so we were making four to $5 a shirt. If you ordered more shirts, it was better. Obviously volume helped. Um, E-commerce so our, is our, a tough business. Like the margins yeah. are usually pretty low. Uh, from yeah, what you I've have seen. to do free shipping. No one wants to pay shipping. Yeah. And so what a lot of people do that I am not a fan of, but I see why they do it is it's free shipping. If you spend a certain amount Yeah, uh, and that gets people to buy, you know, to buy more. I didn't want to do that because I was selling plain basics that I thought every guy deserved to be able to have some plain basic shirts that just fit and not have to break the bank for it. Right. So I was really committed to keeping it at $20 and free shipping on the shirts. I didn't have to raise prices till 2019 or 2020. And at that point shipping, Flat rate shipping had gone from four twenty five for a single envelope to six seventy five, mm. so it had gone up two fifty per shirt. So that ate into the margins. Uh, my cost per shirt went from about five fifty landed to about eight fifty landed. So at twenty dollars, I suddenly was only making a dollar or two per shirt. Like wow. it was not a sustainable. So what what thing was like uh, the most EBITDA that you ever had in like a you know a single quarter or a single year, and what was the least you know in like a percentage uh, amount? Uh, I, I wouldn't be off the top of my head, no percentage amount. The, the, the least we did was definitely, to, uh, kind of towards the end, um, before I raised those prices because we just weren't charging enough. Honestly, it was, it was sad that I, when I had to do it, but I sent an email out, um, we had about 10,000 customers on our email list when I was done and lots of really sympathetic and, uh, understanding. Uh, people responded, um, just just happy that I was still around and not having to call it quits, essentially. And so it, it worked out okay. It, it really irked me to have to do it, but um, it just wasn't making any, any money, you know, kind of at that point. So there there was this price range that had to come. But um, to answer your original question, before we got to that, uh, when we were sort of hit that plateau at 150000 we were right around that 20 to 25% margin on that. So it was good as a little side business. It's one of good. many e-commerce yeah. products, right? You know, we had a we had the cheater wrench going great. We had the, you know, so it was all of them together. It was it was working out pretty well. But then I tried. Um, I said, okay, I'm going to do some some Google ads because um, I can. And um, no, my phone's buzzing. It's going to come down. Here we go. Don't want it to fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Google ads did a little something. And what where I think the Google ads helped was um, helping me identify more keywords that I could incorporate because I could show my ad for basically everything and see what people were searching. But where, where it really started to take off was doing Facebook. And on Facebook, I did retargeting. So what the strategy was is I hired a writer that would come in and these blog posts were maybe 300 words, um, three to 500. They were very, they were pretty short. But we would just basically answer any question that had the word tall. <laughs> so if you go to answerthepublic.com, it is a great resource, a great tool. 
Answerthepublic.com will tell you, you type in any word or phrase, and it will give you a list of questions people are asking on search engines using that word or phrase. So if I put in tall, it would you would get anything from how tall are the dude perfect guys to how tall is the world's tallest tomato plant. Random. <laughs> out right now. Totally, yeah, totally random stuff. The block, we may still even show up. I, tall Slim Teas might even still be there for all I know. Oh, is this is Neil Patel. Know. What's that? This is Neil Patel's tool, right? Uh, it wasn't at the time. <laughs> Maybe oh, now. Okay. I mean, this was six, six or seven years ago. And I typed in tall and got this list of hundreds and hundreds of questions. A lot of them were about celebrity heights. You know, how tall is so-and-so? But what I would do then is we'd write a targeted blog post to that. We'd get the answer box in Google. And we'd get all this traffic of people looking for something related to tall. Now, that doesn't mean they were tall, skinny men themselves, right? But then on Facebook, what I would do is do a retargeting campaign. So anyone who hit my website would have the cookie dropped on their machine. And then if they came to Facebook, they would now see my ad. And it would sort of follow them around. And then on Google, I did the same thing with retargeting. So that as you, and you've probably seen this, you visit a mattress website and um, suddenly you see mattress ads everywhere, right? That's for marketers like me that are, are retargeting you. And man, that thing worked great. We were doing, we were acquiring customers from Facebook ads at less than $10 uh, CPA with, with this ad. And, um, and what was like oh, average yeah. order value on those? Uh... About sixty dollars. The average order is about three shirts. About sixty dollars. So that's that's good. That's good CAC. Yeah, it, it worked out pretty well. Um, it actually started more like fifteen to twenty, but then I found the guy who claims uh, so far undisputed. He's six nine. His name's Eric Grady, and he says he's the world's tallest comedian. And the tallest no what? Comedian. Oh, okay. So no one's challenged him on it. So I give him the title. I say, hey, no one's gonna say anything, right? So I flew him in and to a little studio, actually the Squatty Potty studio, because I had worked there and I knew the photographer and everything. So we filmed a thing there that was very much in the same vein as the Squatty Potty unicorn ad. It was very full of humor, infotainment, we called it. And I wrote it, the script, very similarly to how the, the um, Harmon brothers who did that unicorn ad. Um, if you've seen the Harmon brothers ads, you recognize them kind of when you see them. They all have yeah. a very similar style. And I sort of copy that style. I made that my retargeting ad so that people would see the video. And suddenly this video had thousands of likes, hundreds of comments. Our cost, uh, our CPA went down below $10. It was really generating a really good response. And so I thought, oh man, people really respond to this video stuff. So I thought, I've got to figure out how to get more people to my website so that there's more people to hit with the retargeting campaign. And so then after those ads, we were doing about 200 to 250 um, in, in 2017, 2018, right around there. And it was, and we were still pretty profitable at that 20, 25% range. Did and you have like, have to, so if a first time visitor hitting the site, uh, I'm assuming from what you just said, the conversion rate was much lower than a visitor coming from a retargeting campaign. Like was the conversion rate higher oh, yeah. from retargeting? Yeah, so if you looked at, most of our website traffic was coming through the blog. And so the overall, the website's conversion rate was pretty poor. It was like one, uh, one point something. I don't even remember what. But that's because we were getting, at the time, maybe about 10,000 visitors a month. And about 8,000 came through the blog. And they were just looking up random things like the tallest tomato plant or, or tall Halloween costume ideas or something like that. Totally random stuff. But if you looked at um, on Google Analytics, you can uh, do these different reports and segments and you can see conversion rate by landing page. And people who entered through the home page were converting at seven, seven to eight percent, wow. which was really high. And then people that were coming from retargeting that, that you know, were referred from Facebook or something like that was 10 percent or more. I mean, we were crushing it with the number, which is unheard of really in, in the e-commerce world. Uh, What's well, like but, a lot of like a, a big traffic month for you? Like how much traffic would you be getting? Um, average month was usually seven to nine. Um, the big yeah, months then. were, were holiday, you know, black Friday, we'd get, we would do more orders in black Friday than the month of October. So the whole month of October, we might do 500 orders 
Black Friday week, I'd start it on Wednesday morning and run it through Cyber Monday. And that sale period, we would do 500 plus orders. Wow. <laughs> Easy. So we got a lot more traffic uh, November, December timeframe. But it was actually not seasonal in the sense of um, we had tank tops in the summer. We had hoodies in the winter. There's always something people were coming to get, short sleeve and long sleeve shirts. So the, the traffic stayed you know, pretty consistent across the year. It was just the holidays when it would spike. <clears throat> which was awesome. What, the biggest spike that we ever had um, when I was looking, you know, researching these Facebook advertising uh, avenues and channels, I thought, boy, you could target everything, every interest you can think of, every demographic. It's, it was fantastic. There was only one you couldn't target, and that was height and weight. <laughs> so I thought, dang it, I can't target tall, skinny people. I guess they didn't have the data or it was some protected group or class or, you know, I don't know how that all worked. So I had to think, what, what is something that tall, skinny men would be doing that I could target? And volleyball, I, I ran a BMI study on athletes and the tallest athletes are basketball. Second tallest were volleyball, but the average BMI of a basketball player was something like 25 and a volleyball player was something like 21. Like it was really low. They, so I, I thought my people, right? <laughs> All skinny people are volleyball players. And so there's, unbeknownst to me at the time, and strangely, still to this day, there's no real professional men's indoor volleyball league in the United States. There's groups that have sort of tried and kind of come and gone, but there's nothing like the NBA or the NHL or something like that for volleyball, which surprised me. But there is a beach one. And beach volleyball people are very, um, rabid fans they love beach volleyball and i came to love beach volleyball um, meeting these guys because it was just really cool that i could go to the manhattan beach open which is basically like the rose bowl of beach volleyball and i'm just sitting there filming with my cameraman with some drone footage and who walks past me but one of the best volleyball players in the world phil dahlhauser and he just walking by taking a stroll on the beach no one's bugging him all these random beachgoers, since we're away from the arena, don't even really know who he is. They don't know that an Olympia, a gold medalist is walking past them. And, but they were very accessible. You could just talk to these guys. Um, we went out for drinks after, uh, and, and uh, half the guys were there. We just ch chatted with them and just talked to them. And so I found the tallest. Ryan Doherty was his name, 7'1". And I said, I'm going to sponsor the tallest beach volleyball player there is. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I contact the AVP and uh, AVP is what the league is called. And they were coincidentally that month going to do a um, fundraiser and it was a fashion show. And I thought this was meant to be, you're doing a fashion show. I, and at the time we had women's shirts too. And I said, let me do a line where all eight of your male and eight of your female athletes were walking are dressed in tall slim tees. What would that cost me? They're like, oh, for it was like a thousand bucks or something, a donation. Wow. <laughs> so I said, I'm there. I, I, I sent the stuff. I flew in with my videographer. We made a video of it. I talked to every single one of those athletes after, and we had people locked up, ready to go. This was in October, November. The season started in May. So through that time, I got shirts printed for them, uh, hats, all the swag I could think of. And, and these guys were decorated out. So the two guys I had were Ryan Doherty and Billy Allen. They were partners. And in May, the season starts. The very first one was Huntington Beach, I think. And that week, that month of May was our, at that point, was our best month ever. Topped uh, November. Topped a Black Friday month. It was the biggest month we'd ever had. It was just like the traffic was just skyrocketed, more than doubled. And I thought, oh, I think I'm onto something here. <laughs> something worked out. So I started contacting everyone. that I had them tell their friends. Um, I was going to volleyball matches. I was talking to these guys. Um, one of them was from Utah in Salt Lake. No, two of them, uh, Casey Patterson and Jake Gibb. They played in the Olympics together. They were from Salt Lake. They went up and did something there. Their coach was driving back and randomly at a gas station sees my car, which is all decked out, tall slim tees. And he just comes up to me, hey, you're the tall, slim tees guy. I'm like, yeah, he's all, I coach Jake Gibb and Casey Patterson. I thought, well, these guys, I need to sponsor these guys. And he said, oh, well, they, you know, they already have sponsors or whatever. And then later that day, I'm at Waffle Love, and I run into Casey Patterson at Waffle Love. And, I, and so I get his phone number. We're texting each other. 
it was the, just the coolest thing to sponsor all these guys. And that taught me the power of, of niche influencers, I'll call them. Because you can pay a million bucks to Kim Kardashian and probably get a ton of people to see your product, right? But when it comes to niche influencers, if you have a product that really works for a very specific group, find a very specific um, ambassador, celebrity, influencer, whoever it is, athlete in my case, and you will get a great response. We did the same thing in swimming. Swimmers tend to be tall, long. So with lean, uh, with, with that though, uh, was uh, if I heard correctly, the traffic and the sales that you pulled in from the influencer volleyball strategy was that almost essentially equal to what you were getting yes, from your. Doubled. So you, you we, literally we doubled. Doubled the doubled the revenue in a, in the, in that year. So in 2017, we did two. It was like two ten maybe. And in 2018, it jumped up to 430 or 430 something, I think it was. So to put and that a different way, literally 50% of your sales were coming from specifically the niche volleyball community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's wild. It, it was wild. And, and it wasn't even just these athletes, right? So Kevin Barnett, who was the AVP announcer, he's the one doing the color commentary on the broadcast. He got in on it. We got one of the referees. He got in on it. the MC who was, you know, announcing on, on site. He got in on it. like all these guys were volleyball players at some point that were involved in the sport. They're all tall, slim dudes. They all wanted to get in on it. And then they started saying, you know, you need to go to the, the boys um, national championships, the under 18 for high school. There's 400 teams that show up all these boys, you know, they're gangly teams that are you know, 110 pounds, six foot guys. And um, that was my plan the following year. And, you know, cancer derailed that. But that following year, I was just going to hit up every boys volleyball league I, I pretty much could and start going after uh, the parents. Because by the time I was done, the most interesting thing, I think, was that about 50% of our customers were women. And oh, wow. they were all for dads, kids, husbands, boyfriends, whoever. Well, the users and, of the shirt were always men, right? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. we did. We, we did women's because I noticed this trend. Suddenly, a lot more women were ordering as gifts. So I thought any woman associated with a say their son is a tall, slim boy. Well, they got to get the genetics from somewhere. So there was a chance that mom was tall and slim, right? So I thought tall, slim tees for women. And so we launched the women's line. But I learned a that men and women shop a little differently. So you and I, for example, you open the closet and there's one brand of shirt in there and all the colors, or in my case, all the colors, because I, I could, <laughs> um, but you would just get the one brand, right? Women will open up their closet and there's 40 shirts from 40 brands. And that's just the way it is. And it was just so strange to me that I'd have all these shirt options, colors and styles for women. And they would come and buy one shirt and they would tell me how much they love that shirt. And I thought, there's that shirt that is in six more colors. There's two other styles. Like, why aren't you buying those? They didn't. They just I just love this one shirt. So I don't I don't know what that why that was, but that's just the way men and women are different. So we ended up discontinuing women's because we were selling so few women's shirts. I needed the shelf space to just put in something else for the men because those things were always flying off the shelves. Did you do it and out so, of your, your home garage or did you have a warehouse? Uh, I had a warehouse after about three years we needed a warehouse <laughs> yeah. we were just doing it out of a um office suites so it was just executive office suites we wow. ended up just getting two next to each other and one of them had our computers and stuff and one uh rack of shelves and then the other one we cleared everything out and it's <laughs> full of shelves um but for 200 square feet to be spending 450 dollars a month to rent you know this one office we didn't make sense for storage um, so we got the warehouse which was like 25 cents a square foot oh wow worked a lot better but man i tell you what i i loved getting to know volleyball i learned all the rules i learned all these guys i was following the sport you know closely um was friends with all these guys sell their numbers in my phone and, and stuff like that and, and a lot of them don't stick around and play for very long ryan is now uh i think he's a financial advisor in florida um hmm. they, they don't you know play forever not a lot of money in the sport or something great. or just injuries no. or no, the, the, you can't do it full time professionally, really. Um, even the guys at the top, you can win the biggest tournament, and you and your partner might 
might get ten thousand dollars each or split ten thousand dollars or something there's just not a lot um of money they're trying to change that um i don't know if you remember uh carrie walsh jennings she's Mm -mm. a women's beach volleyball player she won like four straight gold medals or something she's like always winning in the olympics she started a group what was it called i can't remember but it was sort of um beach volleyball tournament meets music festival (laughs) and matched them together (laughs) and just made like this sort of big event out of it um and she was trying to get that going um to really just hype it up more and bring more sponsors and advertisers make it a bigger deal more money for the athletes that kind of thing um but yeah it's it, this is not a very lucrative thing which is why there's not a men's indoor league unfortunately they there's there the nvl has kind of been there they have like six or eight teams or something like that and it's kind of regional and um hopefully one day it, it takes off because i i think volleyball is a great sport um that's that's just so cool. Like it's fascinating to me that you found that as a niche which was capable of doubling your revenue from yeah. you know, you think organic and you know specific, you know, forums and paid channels are gonna be the holy grail, but you just, you know, took all all your channels and doubled it with this just wacky, like, you know, un, you know, it's just it's something I, I probably wouldn't have ever thought of just to, you know. Maybe basketball makes a little bit of sense, but just this random niche that you just like, doubled your revenue with. That's awesome. It was uh, actually kind of funny with basketball that you mentioned that because it's Squatty Potty, Steph Curry's wife. Uh, no, Steph Curry tweeted once, um, went to Sacramento for a road trip, came back, and there's Squatty Potties in every bathroom in the house. <laughs> you know, kind of as a joke. So I'm at Squatty Potty, right? And I'm like, we've got to do something with this. And so we got a Steph Curry jersey at the mall. And we hung it in our bathroom and we tweeted back to him and said, uh, hey, Steph, turns out we've got your jersey in our bathroom, too. <laughs> and so we sent the whole Warriors team squatty potties and um, they wanted to send them shirts with the squatty potty logo and rainbow unicorn thing. So I said, let them be my shirts. <laughs> I looked at the Warriors roster at the time. The shortest guy was 6'1". The tallest guy was 6'11". And so I looked up what size in my shirts they would be. We got them printed and sent them to them. Unfortunately, I never heard anything of what came came from it. But I know at one point, everyone on the Warriors had a Swatty Potty t-shirt. And if you looked at the, the label on the neck, it was actually a tall slim t-shirt. Nice. That's awesome. So uh, at, so at Squatty Potty, you were director of Ecom. Did you work on the, uh, the unicorn poop camp- campaign? So the video came. And they started to blow up, and that's when I came on board. They did; they okay. couldn't keep up with. They were trying; they were so overwhelmed with the response from it. So when I came in, I said, "Let's keep running this unicorn stuff. Like, let's embrace that." So we got. Um, have you heard of the color run, Mm-mm. where the chalk? The, you know, they throw the color chalk at you. Oh yeah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So their their mascot was a colorful unicorn, and our mascot was color uni- colorful uni- uh, unicorn. So I said, "We gotta work together and have like a." partnership where you you know your unicorns on tinder and, and sees our unicorn come up and you know love at first sight or something and so we started working on that campaign and um we had the song the unicorn was going to sing instead of rubber ducky you're the one it's going to be squatty potty you're the one you make poop time so much fun we had the whole thing scripted out we were gonna go you know kind of go with it and we had all these big plans um but then i left to tell some teas at that point when I started at Squatty Potty, we were doing six to eight thousand a month, maybe, and then six to eight thousand at Tall Slim yeah. Tees or at Squatty Potty. Six, six dash two eight, <laughs> so, you know, seven thousand a month, and then suddenly we were doing sixteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand a month after those. But was that staff. at Squatty Potty or at uh, at For Tall Slim Tees? Okay, while right. I was working at Squatty Potty, so Tall Slim Tees has always just been the side thing, and because I could run ads on the side, I could you know do all that kind of stuff, and uh, we were only shipping out five orders a day maybe it wasn't that hard to just kind of go to the warehouse after work and just ship them out and so i left because we were doing so good at tall slim t so i didn't ever get to see it through with the uh, all the squatty potty stuff but um it didn't look like they ended up doing a lot of the stuff we had planned because <laughs> i never saw it come out so uh, okay. they went in different direction tried to do some, try to do other things well, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, do you want to plug your new business a little bit, what you're doing? Yeah. So um, after cancer, I took a lot of time off um, just trying to get back to normal, feel you know, feel like myself, get some energy again. Um, 
And from the sale of Tulsa Slim Teas, I actually invested in a couple local businesses, a restaurant and a, a photo studio, just friends that wanted to get something going. And um, so was helping them with making their website and doing the marketing for it and stuff like that. And was just enjoying it. So I started Decuster Digital. And that is my um, consulting business and marketing agency business where I'll build your website, do your marketing, um, SEO type stuff, and uh, kind of get you going in the right direction there. Uh, consult with you on what your online strategy is, just because I've, I've had all this experience basically trying everything. And uh, when people come to me over the years, they always know me as the web guy, right? So it was always free advice because I wasn't set up to do this. And um, just talk to people through through what they were doing. Um, so then my wife, who is um, a local foodie influencer in our town, so there's maybe 100,000 people in Saint, little St. George, Utah, on the southern tip of, of Utah. We're far from Salt Lake. So we're kind of on an island here. And she's got this local foodie account, oldest, largest following. And um, we decided to do a print-on-demand business, which is um, you don't have to carry the inventory on, on the shirts or, or any, any product, mugs, hats, aprons, you name it. And so she's going to do these foodie designs, um, you know, tacos are my love language or something written on the shirt. And then we're going to uh, launch a website at thefoodieboutique.com which is going to be a boutique sort of, you know, apparel shop for is that foodies. Up yet or not, not yet. Um, it's getting up. It's there. It's just not functional. You can't buy anything. I haven't even set up a, a payment processor yet. It's literally working on it right now, uh, but we're excited to get that going. So she's basically uh, the two investments we made were my first two sort of clients, if you will. And she's, uh, she's basically my third <laughs> and each of these, I, I own, a, I own something. So, uh, but yeah, looking to grow that and help people with their web presence and, and stuff like that. So um, it, it should be pretty fun to do because it's just what I've always done and enjoy doing. Yeah, and I was going to ask you why not? Uh, why 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 move into the agency space rather than doing another e-commerce business? And it sounds like you are kind of doing that e-commerce business with your wife, so you kind of have yeah. uh, both uh, both ends of the spectrum there. That's cool. Yeah, so it's almost like a little friendly competition. So to Custer Digital, I'm a 100% owner of my own LLC. The Foodie Boutique, she is the 100% owner of her LLC. So it's like a, who's gonna who's gonna outdo who? You know, at the end of the year and, and stuff like that. But of course, she's dependent on on me making her website and, and driving traffic to it and stuff. But you know, as she keeps up with the designs, um, a lot of what we're gonna do is through influencers. And, you know, there's foodies everywhere. Um, are you so guys we'll both hundred percent in on your businesses? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, so she like, she like, you're not working full-time anywhere and she's not working nope. full-time. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Love that. We're, we're all in on this and helping our, our, uh, businesses that we invested in. They literally just launched in September. And so they're still very new startup, you know, kind of phase and, uh, trying to help them through that. Cause neither of them have uh, started a business before. So, um, walking through, you know, you might not get paid in the first month or two, or you know, like sometimes these take take time. But they're both actually going really well and and uh, growing. Obviously, with the restaurant, I am married to the local foodie, you know, in in town, so she can plug the restaurant and really uh, really put it on the map, which was which was awesome. And so um, it's just really fun to to see other people to be that sort of angel investor. We're not talking like huge dollar amounts here, right? It was more just. These are friends that we know, like, and trust that are trying to get something going, and we, we just wanted to help. And so um, we don't own a very big part of their business. It's really all them. We just wanted to help them make it happen. And because for me, owning a business has just been such a really satisfying and fulfilling experience. Um, I've worked at agencies, owned an agency. <laughs> I've worked in, internally at companies. I've worked for myself and done my own thing. So I've kind of run the whole gamut. I've always just really enjoyed having my own thing going, even if it's only on the side. So helping other people do that has just been uh, a really satisfying uh, thing to do as well. So really enjoying it. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, I think we're at a good uh, wrapping up point. Uh, Dan, it's a pleasure. I, you know, we've gone back and forth over email on, uh, yeah. you know, various tall slim tea matters over the years. And uh, yeah. it's awesome to, you know, finally, you know, put a face to the name and, uh, you know, get to talk with you live and hear your story. and. A lot of really great nuggets. I think this is going to be a good episode and I appreciate you coming on. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me.